So thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today. And most importantly, thank you for coming the day before Thanksgiving. I know this is not a fun lecture to attend, but I promise I'm going to teach you guys something. I just want to know who's in the audience. So where are the interns sitting? Yeah, you guys are always clumped, right? So interns, second years? Okay, third years? Okay, do we have any fourth years? <laughs> All two, huh? Okay. So the problem with giving a lecture like this is that the knowledge base is so varied. So what I'm going to do is start off basic. I'm going to ramp up quickly. Pay attention, because I promise you're going to learn something. And at the end, what we're going to do is go over cases. Now, I've given you guys handouts. I don't want you guys reading the handouts right now. Put it away. We're going to use it later. That's just so that when you walk away from this lecture, it's going to be a lot of information. I want you guys to take something home. If you feel like you want to jot notes, that'd be a great place to jot notes. We're going to go through the cases and stuff later. Okay? So why do I do this? Here's why I do this. We all use exactly the same ventilator settings, right? So if you're going to intubate me, what ventilator settings are you going to put me on? Assist control, 500, 12, PIPA 5, 100%. Does that sound about right? Right? For everybody and their mother who walks through the door. Okay. What I'm going to teach you, hopefully, by the end of the day is please do not do that. Please do not do that. Okay? And you're going to understand why, and then what we're also going to understand is troubleshooting the machine. Why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this because I'm going to tell you now that what you do in the emergency department matters. Okay? I don't want you guys fearing this machine. I want you guys to understand this machine. And I want you guys to realize that bearer trauma, volume trauma, these words that we learn, actually occur within the first hour. I also want you to understand that what you do in the ED actually translates to what happens upstairs, right? Think about that patient that you intubate in the middle of the night, then then goes upstairs to the ICU, and then some low-level resident, PGY-1-2, is managing all night. When do you think the first ventilator change is made? Right? 12 plus hours later, you guys are the first line of defense. I want you guys to learn and take ownership of this machine. Okay, here we go. Now, this is meant to be interactive. I want you guys to stop. I want you guys to ask me questions, okay? And most importantly, I want you guys to participate. Now I know what classes are sitting where, so I'm gonna, I promise, ask accordingly. So to start off, I have no disclosures. And let's start off with this. So this is step one, right? You guys are gonna intubate the patient. You guys were talking about these M&M cases where you intubated these very difficult patients, and what usually happens? So you intubate a patient, it's a difficult airway, you get the tube. Everybody gives each other high fives, right? Somebody says something about a ventilator, everybody walks out. Does that sound about accurate? Right? Somewhat. Somewhat. It is, because it's what we do. It's what we all do. How often are you thinking about what's at the other end of this tube? How often are you thinking about this machine? How many of you guys are getting nervous now? A little bit, right? So what I'm going to teach you by the end of this course by the end of the two hours, and two hours I know is a long time, I know we all have a little ADHD, so I promise I'll keep it brief, but I'm going to teach you how to actually use this machine and how to start troubleshooting it. So first off, how many of you guys know what the ventilator uh, alarm sounds like? Okay, thank you. There's always somebody who can do it for me, otherwise I had a YouTube video for you guys. Now, I want you guys to all imagine that sound. Can you imagine it again? Okay. Now, I'm not going to play this video since you guys are all doing this so well, but I want you guys to do it again in your minds, but this time, I want you to sing along, pay attention to me. Can you guys do that in your heads? Okay, can you guys do that to the, to the sound of the machine? Pay attention to me. If you don't, you will have a pericode situation in one of your patients, okay? So I do want you guys to pay attention to this machine. Now, what are we gonna do here for the next hour and a half? We're first gonna go over the indications and goals of mechanical ventilation. Why am I doing that? I'm starting off very basic, because again, we're all sitting here at very different levels. We're gonna go through the phases of mechanical breathing, and I need you guys to understand the way we are all breathing right now versus what the ventilator is doing so that we can start troubleshooting. We're going to go over some important terms, right? How many of you guys have heard of PEEP, peak airway pressure, plateau pressure? How many of you guys feel confident you can define those? Eh, 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 sort of, right? We're going to do it today. We're going to go through some initial settings. Okay, that setting is not going to be what I said in the beginning. And then for the next 
hour, for the second hour, we're actually going to go through some difficult cases. We're going to start troubleshooting. Now, I have a hidden agenda. My hidden agenda is, first of all, you guys are not going to fear the machine anymore. It's a machine. If I gave you guys a leaf blower, would you guys be nervous? No? Guess what? That's positive pressure, right? The difference here is that you're connecting this to a human being, so I do want you to have a healthy respect for the machine, but not a fear of this machine. Please do not place everybody on the same settings. If you take one thing away, do not put everybody on the same settings. I'm going to help you understand how to start this machine. And please do not set it and walk away. Okay? If I impart anything else, it's that this machine actually affects your entire physiology. And I want you guys to understand that, respect it, and I want you guys to reevaluate these patients. And why is that? How many of your patients get whisked up in the first hour? Pretty funny, right? Isn't that pretty funny? Okay, how often do you guys intubate somebody, say something about the ventilator, walk out of the room, admit to the MICU? Right? How long does that whole process take? Maybe about 10, 15 minutes? Two days. Two days? Stop it. I didn't say go upstairs, I said admit to the MICU. <laughs> when the admission order goes in. Two days, is it really? It's a little tough? <laughs> so in most of our places, once we admit to the MICU, we kind of forget about these patients, right? No longer our patient, we move on to the next. That's what I don't want you guys doing anymore. All right, so let's go over the indications for mechanical ventilation. Now it's time for you guys to talk. Why do you intubate somebody? Airway protection. Airway protection. What else? Respiratory failure. Respiratory failure specifically? Can't ventilate. Can't ventilate or can't oxygenate. Or? Both. Or? You guys just had a trauma m &M, right? You guys were talking about going to a third floor? Right? It's that person who you kind of can't trust. All right? So let's go through this. Can you guys hear me if I walk away from that mic? Can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. So the first is the unprotected or unstable airway. This is the person who's going to fail, who's going to crash, that high C-spine injury that you guys were talking about before. Right? You don't want this person to get away from you, the person who's vomiting copiously, the person who's bleeding, right? where you lose the ability to intubate them later. That's the guy you want to get control of fast. Now, in my mind, when I'm talking about the ventilator, I kind of separate it out. I have my hypercapnic respiratory failure. This is when the CO2 is going to be high. This is the person who's not ventilating. And why do I do this in my mind? Because when I'm thinking about the hypercapnic, I'm going to muck around with their respiratory rate and their tidal volume to fix the problem. Okay? Versus if I have a hypoxic respiratory failure, this is the person who can't oxygenate, I'm now going to start mucking around with the PEEP and the FiO2. Okay. Is it possible to have both? Yes. And then there's that other guy, right? The trauma patient, the altered, the combative. I need to scan them. I need to be safe. I need to get them to a procedure. All right. Let's go through this. Now, you put somebody on positive pressure ventilation, right? That's what you're doing with the mechanical ventilator. I'm now blowing air into the patient. What does it do to the heart and the circulation? What does it do to preload? Decreases preload. How does it decrease preload? Which compresses the IVC, decreasing return to the right side of the heart. Okay, very good. So it decreases venous return, which then decreases preload. Okay, so if my patient is dehydrated to begin with, what's going to happen to that patient once I stick them on the ventilator? Right? Blood pressure is going to tank. Okay. What is it going to do to afterload? This one's always a little harder, right? I'll give you a hint. It's 50-50. Is it going to go up or down? Come on, guys, guess. Well, it'll increase your right heart, heart pressure. Let's talk left. Sir? Left heart. What's it going to do to your left heart? <coughs> it's going to decrease afterload. Okay, so by increasing the transmural pressure, it actually makes it easier to forward flow. This is precisely, and we're going to kind of go through this in a little bit, this is why you use CPAP on your heart failure patient. Okay? We're going to get back to that. What about the lungs? What does it do to the lungs? Come on, these are all fancy words that you guys have learned some point in medical school, right? So what does it do? So it increases the pressure inside of the lung. Yeah. As opposed to when you take a breath in, you're actually using negative pressure. Okay, good. Chest wall to draw air. Okay, great. So this is when you get the pneumothorax, the bearer trauma, the volume trauma, stuff like that, right? What does it do to gas exchange? 
How can it affect gas exchange negatively? How does gas exchange occur? Capillaries. Okay, if I put too much pressure in the chest, what's going to happen to those capillaries? Not necessarily rupture, but I'm going to definitely collapse them, right? If I collapse them, am I actually exchanging any gas? Well, what's the point of putting somebody on the machine, right? So I want you guys to think globally, and I'm just picking on three different systems here. I can go through every single organ system and tell you how it's going to positively and negatively affect it. So I want you guys to think about this globally. When you take over and when you say that I'm going to put somebody on the ventilator, you've now bought their physiology. Okay? So what are your goals? So we went through the indications, right? We're all super comfortable with the intubation portion. Why are you ventilating them again? Why are you doing this? Optimize like uh, ventilation, optimize oxygenation, so keep the PCO2 where you want it. Okay, great. The indication, not be hyperoxic. Good. Perfect. We're just trying to fix the pathophysiology that happened. Okay. All right, very good. So I will tell you the reasons that I actually use the mechanical ventilator, and you guys are touching upon all of them, okay? So first, I'm going to say this one twice. You want to ensure gas exchange is sufficient to meet the patient's metabolic demands. So something has gone wrong in the body. And what you're doing is trying to support them through that process as they're healing. Okay? So you want to ensure gas exchange is sufficient to meet the patient's metabolic demands. And why is that important? Each disease process has its own set of requirements, right? Which can change based on the person as well. A COPD -er that you intubate is very different than an ARDS patient that you intubate. Okay? You want to adjust the ventilator settings to reduce the risk of further decompensation. I can hurt people with this machine, and my goal is not to do that. And most often, there's that concept of permissive hypercapnia. So you often want to correct the hypoxemia more than the hypercapnia. The caveat, though, is that anybody who's brain or heart injured, so your stroke patient, your head bleed patient, your myocardial infarction patient, you actually need to pay attention to the CO2 as well. Does that make sense so far? OK. Now let's talk about breathing. OK, let's talk about mechanical breathing. We're going to start introducing some of these terms. If you guys have any questions, I want you to stop and ask me. How do you breathe? Let's talk about airflow. And I think you alluded to a little bit before. So talk to me about airflow. How does it work? How is it that you're getting the air into you right now? You generate a negative thoracic pressure. How? OK. So brain says, time to breathe, right? This is, this is a process that you don't need to think about. Can I do it actively? Yes. Does it happen passively, involuntarily? Absolutely. Something says to diaphragm, start working. What does the diaphragm do? Okay, so it drops. And then what happens to your chest? It's going to expand. What happens to airflow? It just gets sucked in. Negative pressure, right? Okay, so that's inhalation. How does exhalation occur? Passively. How? Diaphragm relaxes, comes up, chest Okay, does that concept make sense? This is what we learned in medical school, right? How does this work again? Push air in. Pushes air in, right? Positive pressure. Okay, how does that work again? Generate a higher than atmospheric pressure so that airflow is also directed. Okay. It's basically generating the differential pressure. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> the machine is just in blowing extra air okay. to compensate for whatever the patient is unable to do. Okay. Anybody else have anything else that they want to add? Okay, good. So you guys are saying all the right stuff, right? Now let's put it all together. By the way, how does the machine exhale? It doesn't. It doesn't? So you never exhale? It's still passive by the body. It's passive by the body? It decreases the pressure so that... It decreases pressure? Doesn't uh, suck? No, but instead of going 10, you're going down to 5, so that there's, when you're at 6 in the oh, body, you're first out. You're not right. yeah, sucking it out, you're just decreasing the pressure. But it's still not exhaling, it's, it's just changing external pressures, allowing you to allow you to passive. So a valve opens. So in the machine, a valve opens that allows for exhalation. Okay? And that, that is either triggered by time, pressure, whatever you set it at. 
right? And this is why we're doing this, because this is, this is a black box, right? This is a mystery. I want you guys to understand this machine a little bit better. Now let's kind of go through this. I need a volunteer. I need a healthy volunteer with a good set of lungs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. She's so gonna stand right there so we can all see. We're gonna do a little party trick, okay? So you get to choose your favorite color. Okay. Tell me your name. Maha. Maha. It's very nice to meet you. Nice right? to meet you both. So, Maha is now gonna demonstrate for us what the ventilator is gonna do. Okay. Now you're gonna do me a favor. You're gonna blow a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you're just gonna hold. Okay? okay. All right. Now she's gonna demonstrate peep for us. A little bit more. Stop. Okay. And hold that pressure. So was that easy? I know you guys can all imagine this. Imagine doing it with her. Was that easy getting that initial little air in? No. Right? So that's the extra little work of breathing that's required to open up your alveoli. And this is what you're doing when you wake up every morning and stand up and take a big deep breath and yawn. Right? That is PEEP. So when I have a little extra pressure left in my balloon, my alveoli, it's now going to make it easier for her to add air in. Does that make sense? Okay, blow a little more. Keep going. Oh. A little more. Okay, stop about there. I don't want her to hyperventilate. So does that look like a little healthy alveoli? It's pretty, it's pretty all right, right? Doesn't look super stretched out? Yeah. Looks all right, right? This is your plateau pressure. So right now there's no airflow in here, and your alveoli see a certain amount of pressure. That pressure that your alveoli see will be the plateau pressure. Okay, we're going to go over this again. Now I want you to blow it so it looks like it's a little stretched out. Okay. Okay, sub about there. Okay, now it's kind of looking like it's getting a little tenser, right? Looks like if she keeps going it might even pop. That is peak airway pressure. Okay, if I go, if I keep going above a certain level, I'm going to start causing injury. Okay, and I just want you to let go. That's exhalation. Just keep letting go. Okay, that is the way the ventilator does its work. Does that make sense? Okay. And this is for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to do this one more way. All right, now I'm going to show you guys this graphically. Does this make sense so far? So now there are four stages of mechanical breathing, and we're going to go through these. So the first stage, and we're going to do this on the pressure over time curve, right? Does this look familiar from a ventilator when you guys stare at the machine? So pressure over time curve, let's kind of start understanding what these curves mean. So the first is the initiation phase. Something, the machine, or someone, the patient, is going to initiate the first breath. Okay? Now, if the patient is comatose, You've set a respiratory rate, a backup rate, right? So the machine says every X number of seconds, I'm going to deliver a breath. If the patient is awake and over-breathing the machine, the patient will do it. How do you tell the difference? How do I know if it's the patient or the machine that took this breath? They call it downward deflection. Yeah, what does the downward deflection mean? Is that patient or is that machine? The patient's generating it. Yeah. So the patient, if the patient generates a negative pressure, there will be a negative deflection. If there is no negative deflection, it's the machine doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, so something, someone initiates the breath and then you have flow of air that generates some pressure in the lungs, in the alveoli. That is known as your inspiratory phase. And this is where there's airflow. Okay, now I want you guys to do this with me. So something, someone, you are the person who's going to initiate the breath. You take that big deep breath and then you hold it for a few seconds. That hold, breathe, that hold is your plateau pressure. Okay, now if you guys do this exercise in your seats, can you imagine what plateau pressure feels like now? Okay. So during the plateau phase, there is no more flow of air. This is when things kind of equalize, you hold it for a few seconds, and then the valve opens and you start exhaling. Okay, right. let's do this a different way. That top pressure is your peak airway pressure. I don't want that peak airway pressure to be above 35 centimeters of water. That's when I start running into trouble. My plateau pressure, I don't want generally above 30 centimeters of water. Okay. 
The difference between these two is known as the airway pressure, and that tells me about the resistance in the system. This is going to become clearer as we start doing other cases. And then your alveolar pressure, this is what the alveoli are actually going to see, is your plateau pressure. Okay, so let me stop there for a second. What's more important, peak airway pressure or plateau pressure? Plateau pressure. Okay, so what the alveoli are truly seeing, which each breath, is going to be the plateau pressure. Does that mean that peak pressure is not important? Can I let it be like 60? That's when we're going to run into trouble, okay? So it's kind of a trick question. Both are important, but the alveoli are sensing the plateau pressure. Okay. Can we go to the, sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. When you take a deep breath in, in, in <coughs> so the deep breath in and hold, that's the peak or the plateau? So when you take a deep breath in, you're generating some pressure in your chest, right? Yeah. When you hold it for a few seconds, that pressure is going to equalize, right? Peak might equal plateau, but whatever equalizes, whatever's kind of left over, when you stop the airflow, that's going to be your plateau pressure. Okay, Does that concept make sense? Is that the maximum pressure that's generated at inspiration is your peak? That's your peak airway pressure. And then when that pressure equalizes, when the airflow stops, that's your plateau pressure. Make sense? Plateau is more related to like their lung compliance. Correct. Whereas the other one's like the actual airway, so like obstruction and stuff like that would give you a higher peak pressure. That's right, we're going to get into that in more detail. Yeah? Um, one thing I, I don't know if we talked about was the time portion of that. So how much time are we expecting between the peak pressure yeah. and then the flat? That's a great question. We're going to get to that. It really depends on what you do with the machine. Okay. What the inspiratory hold does. It depends on what you do with the machine. Right. We're getting there. Okay? So now let's look at this. This is, I don't know what kind of ventilator you guys use. It doesn't matter. I chose something super archaic that I'm pretty sure you guys haven't seen. Okay, because it really actually doesn't matter. The curves are going to be the same. The concept is the same. So what does this look like to you guys? So this is your pressure over time curve. We haven't gotten to this. This is flow over time curve. We're going to do that next. But what I want you guys to tell me is on the machine, can you see what your peak airway pressure is? You guys have seen ventilators before, right? So is the peak airway pressure somewhere on the machine? Usually. Usually, right? That's one of the things that's listed. We'll kind of go over that in a little bit. How do you figure out the plateau pressure? Inspiratory hold. Does that concept make sense now? Do you understand why you're doing the inspiratory hold? What you're saying is, blow it open, hold, I don't want any airflow, get me a value. And that value, when you do that inspiratory hold button, you're going to get your plateau pressure. Okay? That's why you're doing that. So plateau pressure of 38, did we say that's good or not good? Not good, right? That's high. That's too high. That tells me that I have a problem down here in the lungs. Okay, now what's PEEP? Sorry, these triangles appeared, or the uh, rectangles. So what is PEEP now? PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. That is whatever value you set, five, right? That's our general number that we start off with. That's the number above baseline that will be there at the end of expiration. Make sense now? And that number, whatever you choose, and we'll figure out how to choose that number, helps with the next breath by taking over some of that work of breathing required to open up the alveoli with each breath. All right? Now, I'm going to add to this curve now. We've gone through pressure over time. Any questions about that so far? So far, OK. Now I'm going to start adding flow. Okay. Let's talk about flow for a second. I'm going to go through the four phases of mechanical breathing again so we can review this again. So something, someone, in this case the patient, is going to initiate the breath. And then there's going to be a flow of air during which you're going to generate a certain pressure reaching some peak airway pressure. Then the flow of air is going to stop during your plateau phase where there's no more airflow. And then some valve is going to open causing a negative deflection, right, outward flow. And you're going to be exhaling. This curve should come back to baseline. We're going to talk about what happens when that curve does not come back to baseline. You guys with me so far? So this is known as your peak inspiratory flow and your peak expiratory flow. We're going to talk about inspiratory flow and how you manipulate that number as well. Now let's do volume. So these are your three curves, pressure, flow, and volume. I'm going to do the same thing for you guys one more time. We're going to go through the four phases of mechanical breathing. So in this case, the patient is going to initiate the breath. 
you're going to have a flow of air such that you're generating a peak airway pressure. You're going to have your plateau phase during which the pressure is going to be held at some number. You can you know, you generate your plateau pressure that the alveoli are going to see. And that's when you're going to get your tidal volume, which is the area under the curve. Once the valve opens, you're going to exhale back to your peak air, uh, your peep value. Pressure is going to go down. Airflow is going to come back to baseline, and your volume is going to dissipate. Mystery solved. Okay, makes a lot more sense. This now we know what we're looking at. Is this specifically intraalveolar volume? This is your tidal volume. All right. So tidal volume is the area under the curve, and this happens during your inspiratory pause. That's when you generate that total volume. It's the area under the curve. Okay. You guys okay so far? You guys ready to start setting up the ventilator? Okay. So here's what I want you guys to do. This is on your sheet, okay? If you look at your worksheet, I kind of gave you guys a ventilator card. So most of these numbers are going to be manipulated, and we're going to go through how to do that. But you're going to choose a mode of ventilation. And I'm going to argue that assist control, volume control, is actually one of the safest modes of ventilation in the emergency department, and I'm going to show you why. You're going to choose a tidal volume. The tidal volume is going to be 6 to 8 mLs per kg. We're going to figure out why. You're going to set some respiratory rate. You're going to set an FiO2. By the way, what FiO2 am I breathing right now? 21. 21. What's the FiO2 you set on the ventilator? What's the lowest number? What's the lowest number? 21. 21. <laughs> so you can, you can say it's 21. We extubate people on 40, right? But the 40 is just a number that we kind of have artificially chosen. Okay? You're going to set some peep. Please do not set the peep lower than 5. Do you guys understand why now? Okay? I've seen people set a peep of 0. That's just mean. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's, it's hard. It's actually a lot of work to breathe through a straw. So don't do it. Plateau pressure, we've now learned you want it to be less than 30. You want your peak airway pressure to be less than 35. Your flow and your I to E ratio, I'm going to get back to you. and We're going to go through these in cases. I want you guys to understand this. Where does this come up? I to E ratio. I think that's one you guys are more familiar with. The obstructive disease processes, right? And we're going to figure out how to manipulate these safely. Most people do not even know about this, the flow. The flow by default is set at 60 liters per minute on your ventilator, and you can manipulate this number as well. I will teach you what that means. Okay. All right, assist control. Now, I just argued that assist control is the safest mode of ventilation in the emergency department. Okay. Now, assist control, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have been told that uh, in severe asthma, yeah. Okay, we're going to go through one of these cases, okay, where my sphincter tone was set at maximum. It was a very scary case, and we're going to understand why and what you do with PEEP. So hang tight to your question. I promise I'll answer it. Okay? So assist control, I'm arguing, is the safest mode of ventilation in the emergency department. Now, assist control comes in two flavors. It comes in volume control or pressure control. And what does that mean? What this means, let's say I set assist control, volume control, I'm saying that the dependent variable, what I am regulating, is going to be my volume. Okay, so when you say tidal volume of 500, what you're saying is assist control, volume control, I want my tidal volume to be 500. Make sense? You can choose a pressure, you can choose pressure control, and why would I ever do that? I would do that, let's say, for example, somebody's peak airway pressures are so high and I'm having such difficulty controlling them, and I want that to be my dependent variable, I can go ahead and do that, but realize your volume is going to vary quite a bit, now you need to keep an eye on that volume, because then you're going to have trouble ventilating. Okay, so how does assist control works? The name suggests that it assists the patient. Can somebody actually, in layman's terms, describe to me what assist control does? So I think it's if you set the volume at 500 and the patient's only able to get 350 in, it's the machine that's providing that additional 150 okay. uh, liters or whatever it is from there. Okay. So let me make it really simple for you. You set the respiratory rate at 10, and you set the volume at 500 mLs. Every single one of those 10 breaths, the machine is going to deliver 500 mLs. 
Okay. Now let's that we're assuming the patient is completely comatose, not doing any work. Okay. Now let's assume for a second the patient takes two additional breaths by themselves. So you're arguing that the patient's <coughs> going to get 500 with each breath. Say it again. You're arguing that those additional two breaths, the patient will get 500 mLs. Not if you set the. I think I don't think if you set the if, there, if, if the rate was set at 10 and those are additional, I don't think that would happen. I think if those are in conjunction with the machine's respiratory rate, then the machine would deliver the extra. Okay. So this is this is why I'm going through this because people don't quite understand what the machine is doing. So let's, we're going to be very simple about this. I'm setting the tidal volume to 500 mLs. I'm going to set the respiratory rate to 10. The patient's completely comatose, not helping. Okay? Every single one of those breaths, that the 10 breaths per minute, the patient is going to get 500 mLs. The patient now wakes up. The patient decides that they want to take five additional breaths above your respiratory rate of 10 that you've set at baseline. Every single one of those additional five breaths will get 500 mLs. On top of whatever the patient's doing? This, this, that is what the patient is doing. The, patient's, the patient feels like they need additional five breaths. So those additional five breaths will get 500 mLs. So the negative pressure is tri triggers the vent to give a, a set? The patient triggers the machine. And when it triggers the machine, the machine's going to say, you triggered me, 500 it is. If the, patient to, if the patient's triggering a breath, couldn't they get some of that air in on their own? They are getting that air in on their own. So when you say, or I'm setting a respiratory rate of 10, what you're saying is that if the patient is out, comatose, not helping, the patient is going to, by default, get 10 breaths per minute, and all of those breaths are going to get 500 mLs. If the patient wakes up, they can take as many additional breaths as they want, right? You can make their respiratory rate 40 if you want to, right? I can start hyperventilating on a ventilator. Each of those additional breaths will get 500 mLs. So yeah. if the patient wants more breath that you're talking about, so if the 500 isn't enough, something's going to happen where it's called double trigger. Yeah. So it'll give, the, the machine will give the 500 cc's. If it still detects negative flow from the patient, if the patient still wants more breath they're trying to inspire, the machine will detect that as the patient's taking another breath in and will give that 500 cc's again on top of the original 500? So what we're assuming right now is that the patient is synchronous with the ventilator. Right. Okay? There's this concept of asynchrony, and that's what he's describing. You know, when you see like the, the curves are doing kind of funky things, and they're stacking on each other, and it looks all weird? That's when the patient's struggling on the machine? We're not talking about that right now. We're just saying the patient is taking an additional five breaths, and each of those additional five breaths will get 500 mLs. Okay? So all of the volume is coming from the machine? You right. set the volume. You told the machine what the volume you wanted. You said, this is, I don't care what else you do. I don't care what your pressure is at the end of the day. I want your volume to be 500 with every single breath that I deliver. OK? Now, how is this different? Just so that you guys understand the concept, have you heard of SIMV, synchronized inter inter uh, intermittent mandatory ventilation? So just so that you guys understand the concept of assist control, I'm going to go through this too, OK? So SIMV. Patient is completely comatose. I set the respiratory rate of 10, tidal volume of 500. Every single one of those 10 breaths will get 500 mLs. Okay? Patient now wakes up, takes an additional five breaths, is synchronous with the ventilator. First breath can get 100. Second breath can be a liter. Third breath can be 800. So on and so forth, right? Very variable. Depends on patient effort. So why is this control safer? I, I know what the machine's doing, yeah. right? I know what the patient's going to do on the machine. So when I walk out of that room as the ER doctor, I know what's going to happen in there. Okay? I don't want my patient taking a liter and a half with each breath. That's just dangerous. Does that make sense? Okay? And it's a great mode of ventilation for the comatose and for the awake patient. Does that concept make sense now? All right. Now, I'd be more than happy to teach you guys other modes of ventilation, but for now, let's stick to this one because I want you guys to understand this one well. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to quickly double check. So yeah. the assist control, regardless of the effort, if you set it to 10 and 500, when they, even if they wake up and they have an effort, still regardless, you're going to have a 500 mL. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Because you set that volume. Yeah. You said, I want 500. Okay. Does this concept make sense now? You guys understand why you're doing assist control? All right. Tidal volume. You guys ready to have fun? Okay. I'm a difficult airway. You get me intubated. High fives. Put me on the ventilator. 
What do you want to know? Height, weight. Really great, guys. <laughs> Let's say I am, my license says I'm five feet tall. I'm probably not, but I'm five feet tall. Does that help? Do you want to wait? No. You sure? Yeah. I feel body weight just based on Okay. Go ahead, put me on the ventilator. I was going to say 500. I promise I'll learn your name. <laughs> Come on, guys, guess. So 364. 364, that's a very specific number. To start. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, somebody must be looking something up back there, huh? Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, ideal body weight. Okay, so ideal body weight, right? So that's kind of what he's going on. What, what exactly is he doing back there? Let's kind of figure that out. So he's looking at this curve over here, right? I'm sure he's got a fancy med calc something something, but it's actually based on this. What is this? It's small. It's supposed to be small. Don't worry. Don't strain your eyes. I'm going to show you what you need to know. This is based on the ARDSnet protocol, okay? And this is kind of where we came up with these numbers. So let's, let's just talk about this for a second. When I was in medical school, which wasn't that long ago, this was like a novel concept, okay? This, this low tidal volume ventilation was a novel concept, which is kind of scary. Before that, they were doing high tidal volume ventilation, which was 10 to 12 mLs per kg, okay, which sounds kind of ridiculous. So that 10, if my ideal body weight is 50 kg, is gonna be the 500, all right? What they learned is that the low tidal volume ventilation actually prevents trauma from occurring. It's actually not low, it's physiologic, it's just low in comparison to what we were doing previously. Okay? So now let's figure this out. So there are curves for females and curves for males, right? Males and females are not similar. It all has to do with body weight and extra water, so on and so forth. But what exactly are we basing this on? Why do you need to know my height? You guys asked for my height. Why do you care about my height? How big are my lungs? That's what you guys are trying to figure out. You guys are trying to figure out the size of my lungs. And it really is dependent on your height. Okay, why is that? Well, if I'm five feet tall and 50 kilos, or I'm five feet tall and 200 kilos, does my lung volume change? No, but I have extra stuff that I'm gonna fight, right? And we'll get back to that in a moment. So how do we set this? Well, that's me. So that's how we came up with 364, right there, right? It's at the end of the curve. That's your eight mLs per kg. So I would actually set me at 300. Scary, right? How often are you guys setting somebody on 300 and walking away? Probably never. Why? Well, you have a range. You have a range. Okay, so you can go anywhere from 273, if you want to be specific, to 360. So 270 to 360. 270 sounds small, right? But it's what I'm actually doing. So let's think about this for a second, because I know you guys bag people all the time, right? The adult bag. How much volume is in there? A liter. a liter? So it's about a liter. Please do not compress that all the way for me. Okay, does that make sense now? Okay, this is why you really need to pay attention to the person who's bagging. Please do not give me a liter with each breath. Okay, now for the same male who's five feet tall, and sorry, some of this went off of the uh, board there, 300 to about 400. Okay, for a five foot tall man. Um, so who gets 500? Can you guys see that? Bigger people. So it's the woman who's six feet tall. A six foot tall woman is going to get 500. And a man who is 5'10". Okay? So I'm doing actually this research project now looking at what we're doing in the emergency department and it is so variable. And one of the patients was set on a tidal volume of 800. I just don't understand why. Um, but who gets 800? That's a seven, tall, seven foot tall woman. Okay? I promise, I've never seen a seven foot tall woman. I've seen a lot of things, I haven't seen that. So, do you guys understand how to set tidal volume now? How to have a healthy respect for this? Respiratory rate. So now you've decided my tidal volume is going to be about 300. What's my respiratory rate again? Why am I intubating? Great question. I have pneumonia. 12, 10. Yeah, I do. Okay, so what is my respiratory rate before, and why is that important? Because that's how fast it took you to. I'm breathing at that rate for a reason. 
Precisely. Precisely. They're doing it for a reason, okay? And I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, I almost killed somebody by setting them on the wrong respiratory rate. And how did I do that? Well, I took a patient during fellowship who um, was a fresh liver transplant. She was septic. She was breathing at a rate of, let's say, 35. All right, so I'm the overnight fellow, and I make a decision. She looks horrible. I'm going to go ahead and intubate her. You know, high fives. I got it in. I felt great about myself. For some reason, I went back about an hour later, and I did an ABG, and her pH was 6.9. What did I do wrong? I set her respiratory rate at 12. Okay, instead of the 35 that she was breathing. So I nearly killed her. Did you keep her paralyzed? Sure. So she could. Unless you're, unless you're paralyzing her. Yeah, I mean, this, this one was sick. Okay. This one was not doing so hot. So I took over. Do you guys understand now why it's so important to think about these things when you decide to take over? Okay, if I had not checked that ABG, she would have coded. All right, so respiratory rate, you're going to figure out what the patient is doing before, why do they need to be intubated, and that's going to help you dictate your respiratory rate. And we're going to get back to this when we talk about our COPD patient. Peep? What do you want to set my peep at? It also on the disease I have pneumonia. Five. When do you go up? Arts. Arts. Anything else? Uh, yeah. CHF. So it's what the patient needs, right? What happens when you increase the PEEP? What do you have to pay attention to? Blood pressure. Blood pressure, right? So what you're doing is increasing the pressure in the chest. We talked about how that decreases venous return. So if a patient is dehydrated and I start increasing the PEEP, the patient's blood pressure is going to drop. All right, so YouTube video. This is just so that you guys understand what PEEP looks like. Has anybody actually seen PEEP actually work? Let's see if this works. You are recording again. This is a different angle. Don shot, zip. And we're going to go. Okay, so don't worry about zip and all that business this guy is talking about. Here's kind of what this is. This is a rodent model. And what this guy is doing is recruiting the lungs. So in essence, kind of cranking up the PEEP. Do not do this by yourselves in the emergency department. This is something that I do in the ICU, watching the patient like a hawk. But this is what PEEP actually does, okay? So what he's done now is cranked up the PEEP. Let's see if we can play this. You guys see how the lung is being recruited? Okay, parts of the lung that were not previously working are all of a sudden gonna start participating in the oxygenation and ventilation process. Okay, and then you're going to see he's just going to drop the peep all of a sudden. Look what happens. Okay, pretty dramatic, right? So that's what you guys are doing with peep. All right. FiO2, so we said tidal volume of 300, right? My respiratory rate, let's say, is 12 for a moment. My PEEP is 5, my FiO2? What, what's, your, what's your SpO2 before the respiratory Okay, what's my, what is an SpO2? Pulse ox. Pulse ox. Do you guys understand that difference? So an ABG gives you an SaO2. Your SP is your pulse ox number. My pulse ox was 85. Start at 100, crank down. Okay, we all kind of do that, right? Start high, think about it, go low. How often are you walking back into the room and cranking down? You're not, right? It's okay, you're not. If you think about it, you are. There's actually some that argue that you should start low. Muck around with your peep if you need to for the oxygenation component. But don't, don't over-oxygenate the patient. There's actually this great paper that's going to be coming out in the next several months about hyperoxia in the emergency department and how it increases mortality in patient. Right? So remember, what you, guys, what you guys do with the ventilator actually matters. So the flow rate and the pattern, you guys have heard of ramped and square wave. We're going to kind of touch on those a little bit. And then your I to E ratio, we're going to talk about those when we talk about a case. So here's another archaic ventilator, okay? You guys ready for me? I'm gonna do a little, a little test. So you, how many curves do you guys see on this 
ventilator. Two? I heard two. So what are they? What is this curve? Pressure. Pressure. How do you know? Okay, very good. <laughs> good answer. Um, but also the waveform, right? We kind of talked about this waveform. And then what is this curve? That's your flow curve, right? That means flow. Okay, what is the mode of ventilation here? Okay, so it's this control, volume control. What's the patient's FiO2? <coughs> Okay. Where are you guys looking? Top, bottom? I see eyes kind of going back and forth. Bottom. Okay. So the bottom is what you have set. So you're set the FiO2 to 100. What did, what did we set the PEEP at? 22, right? You guys ever going to do that? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Does this PEEP of 22 correlate with your pressure curve? Yeah. So you see how this baseline number is at about 20? Okay, I know you guys can't see those numbers, but does that make sense now? Okay, um, what's your tidal volume? 350, this person was my size, I can tell you that already. Okay, um, what's the respiratory rate again? Set at 32. Set at 32. How fast is the patient breathing? They're breathing 32? How do you know that? Up top. Okay, good. So this F, that's for rate. The patient is breathing at 32. You've set it at 32. Is the patient over-breathing the ventilator? No. No. I know that two ways. Number one, those numbers correlate. Number two, do you guys see any negative deflections? No. Does that make sense now? Okay. What's your tidal volume? What is the tidal volume the patient is actually getting? 385. 385. Do you guys see that on top? Okay, so about 350. You're not going to get an exact number. And what's the PEEP that the patient is actually getting? 22, again up here. Okay. And what is this number here? Is it minute ventilation. What does that number mean? 12 yeah, what is that? So they're 32 times 385. Yeah, so it's your tidal volume times your respiratory rate. Is that high, low, good, bad? It's a little high. It's higher than normal physiology, which tells me that there's a disease process going on, but consistent with these crazy ventilator settings. But it's what we're, yeah, I was going to say, but it's what we're set. Correct. You did this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the patient's not over-breathing currently. Um, what's your peak airway pressure? <coughs> the peak airway pressure. What's the peak airway pressure? It's 37. 37? All right. So you guys see that up here. Is that high? Is that good? We're good? You want to walk away? It's a little high, right? So it's above the 35. What does that tell us? There's some resistance in the system, okay? So I want you guys to understand this for a second. If my peak airway pressure is high, and let's assume for a second my plateau is normal, what that tells me is that there's resistance coming from the machine into my body, okay? So what I think about is a problem here, all right? Neck up. So is the patient biting on the tube? Is the tube kinked? Is the tube in place? Is the patient bronchospastic? Does that make sense? Mucus, Mucus plugging. All right. Um, did we do an inspiratory hold? Yes. Yeah? How do you know? There's a <laughs> so there's a number. Whoops. So there's a number here, right? Your plateau pressure is 31. Is that good, bad? It's, it's just a little high. And this is what your inspiratory hold is going to look like on the ventilator, what the curve is going to look like. So notice that the flow is held for a few seconds. That leads to this pressure that's calculated up here for you. That disappears after a few seconds, after you press the inspiratory pause button. Okay, so this is kind of a snapshot right after the inspiratory pause button was held. I have a question about that. Yeah. When you press the inspiratory hold, does it like automatically know, do you have to time it yourself with the peak? Or it's timed. Correct. And then it just stops holding it. Because if, if, if it did that, the patient would stop breathing, right? You can't just keep holding that button. No, but what I mean is like, I know it stops, but it's so you want to do that at the peak 
peak of inspiration? The machine will time it. Okay. So, so when you press the button, button nope, itself. when you press the button, the machine is saying now calculate. Okay. Okay? The machine is smarter than we are. Does that all make sense so far? You guys beginning to understand this a little bit better? All right. Now, we are going to take a break, I promise. I know you guys need a break. I know this was a lot of information. But let's talk about this for a second. What is this? Non-invasive. All right, non-invasive. Um, I can do, so what are we actually talking about when we talk about non-invasive? We're talking CPAP and BiPAP, right? I can do CPAP and BiPAP on the ventilator. Okay, I know we don't often think about that. I can do CPAP and BiPAP invasively and non-invasively. Okay. So, CPAP, what does it stand for? Continuous positive airway pressure. What does BiPAP stand for? Bi-level positive airway pressure. I have gotten in trouble once during my fellowship for calling it BiPAP. One of the purists I was working with told me that it's actually BPAP because BiPAP is like saying Band-Aid when you mean bandage. I call it BiPAP, okay? But just, be, <laughs> just so that you know it's out there. If I ask you guys to draw a CPAP curve, what does it look like? Straight line. Straight line? At what number? Whatever you said. Okay, so what are the, what is the actual values of the curve? x-axis, y-axis? Pressure and, pressure and time. So what we're talking about is a pressure and time curve. Okay, what we're talking about is this. So you set some pressure. Give me a number. Make it up. 45? 45. 45? That's crazy high. <laughs> <laughs> let's say 5. Okay? 5. Give me 10. So what you're setting for a CPAP setting. So let's say, let's pretend for a second this is 10 centimeters of water. What you're saying is that throughout the entire respiratory cycle, I want the patient to get a PEEP of 5. When do you use this? Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea? Okay. So you guys are probably not using it for sleep apnea unless your patient's sleeping in the ED overnight. <laughs> CHF? COPD? Do you guys want to use it for COPD? You can? You can't. So why are you using CPAP? I want you guys to understand this, okay? And I will tell you, I didn't really understand this until I got the fellowship. So you're, okay. So this isn't quite PEEP. PEEP is at the end of expiration. It's at the end of expiration. This is a continuous. So let's think about this for a second. It's kind of similar to PEEP in what it does. So what does it do to preload again? Decreases preload. Okay, what does it do to afterload? decreases afterload, making it easier for me to have forward flow, helping augment my cardiac output, right? So I'm decreasing the return flooding of my lungs, and I'm increasing my forward flow, the output from my heart. This sounds perfect for which disease process? CHF. Does that make sense now? Okay, so this is great for CHF. Um, by the way, when is the patient breathing? Whenever they want. What does it look like on here? If I were to map out the patient's breaths, what does it look like? So it'll be a sinusoidal curve. Okay, the patient's doing whatever they want. Have you guys ever tried CPAP or BiPAP? You guys, I suggest you try it so you know what it feels like. Okay, um, I tell patients that it feels like they're sticking their head out of a car window when it's going about 80 miles per hour. It's actually very uncomfortable to breathe until the patient finds their rhythm. And it's actually super important because if you fight the machine, it's not going to work. Okay. So now that we know that a decrease is preload, what's important? Monitor that blood pressure. Make sure that they're intravascularly de repleted despite being volume up. Make sense now? Okay. So CPAP is great for the hypoxic patient because it augments the positive pressure, therefore decreasing their work of breathing, allowing them to kind of relax a little bit. Okay, great for the hypoxic patient. So when do you use BiPAP? COPD. So this is a patient who potentially has hypoxia but also has hypercapnia. It also helps with ventilation. And let's figure out how it does that. So same curves, pressure and time. And now you're doing this, right? If I asked you guys to draw it, you'd come up with something like this? So what is this? So you guys set the high number, the low number, right? What are you doing? Give me examples. 
12 and 6? Great. 12 and 6, you set a respiratory rate? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so you say 10 over 6 to your respiratory therapist and walk away, okay? So what, is, what are you actually saying? You're saying that this number here, which is synonymous to your PEEP, is your expiratory positive airway pressure. Okay, that's your, the I and the E that you're setting, this is your E. The I, which is your inspiratory peak airway pressure, is synonymous with your peak airway pressure. So if I say that number is going to be 10, the peak airway pressure is going to be 10, and my PEEP is going to be 5, 6, whatever you decide to set. Patient, again, is breathing throughout this entire cycle in a sinusoidal fashion. So how does this work with ventilation? Okay, so it creates a gradient. And that gradient that you're setting helps allow ventilation. Okay, that helps kind of push out that excess gas and clean out basically the system. But the patient is taking breaths no matter if it's a high number or a low number. Does that concept make sense now? Okay, this is why this is great for the CPAP, for the COPD patient. This is why you don't want to put your COPD patient on just pure CPAP. Cool? Any questions? Yeah, can you say that again? So, um, I mean, I, I definitely understand the CPAP part <coughs> being equivalent to, to PEEP. <clears throat> the inspiratory part, though, so it, it, you, you know, you said it at 12 or something like yep. that. But my, when I'm breathing in, I'm breathing at, at like, you know, 500 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what does that 10 do to my 500? So you're talking about volume. Oh, I see. So you're, when you say 500, you're talking about volume. When we're talking about this 10 and 5, I'm talking about pressure. Yes. And it's the difference between the pressure that allows me to ventilate. So let's say you have a patient who has COPD. Their CO2 is, let me make it a crazy number, 90. I set them at 10 over 5. Okay, I walk away. I come back. That number is now, the CO2 is now 80. What do I want to do to help them get rid of more CO2? Increase my gradient, right? So that's when I go over 15 over 5. I start mucking around with my pressures so that I'm creating more of a gradient to allow them to actually get rid of the CO2. Does that make sense? Why don't we ever approach that close to 35? You can, so you can do what you want, but realize that the higher you set these numbers, the more consequences there are. Right? So what I'm trying to do is find that sweet number that allows me to get the actual ventilation I need without harming the patient. If I don't need to start at 35, it doesn't make any sense to start at 35. Lower is better. Exactly. This is pretty uncomfortable. You know, I was, I'm not kidding when I say that you guys should actually kind of get a sense of what this feels like. And I know you guys know what it feels like to stick your head out of a car window, right? You guys have stuck your hand out of a car window? You know that extra pressure that you feel? It's actually very uncomfortable to breathe. And the higher I set that number, the more uncomfortable it is. So literally, when I set my patients on this, I literally sit with them and I try to keep them calm. Because unless they find their rhythm with this machine, it's actually kind of difficult. Okay. For a normal, so what do you mean by normal? Like it's, if the max, if, if the healthy maximum is 35, like what are, what are, you, are we all going at right now at about 10 or like 15? So we're, we're okay, I, I think I see what you're saying. So this is to help you augment your ability to release. So what I'm doing is generating an extra pressure in the chest to help the person ventilate. Okay, so when we say 35, we're talking about that peak airway pressure. You're talking about ventilator pressures, right? So I'm not going to generate that kind of pressure using this machine. Can I? Yes. I don't want to. You should know as well, this is positive pressure, right? So you don't do that. Right. This is still positive pressure. Right? It's, it's, so it's creating right now, a positive right? pressure gradient and then releasing that and creating a, 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 a pressure gradient that forces the air out. But when you ask what you're doing normally, you're spontaneously is negative pressure. Right? Exactly. Makes sense? So use the example of CHF for, for CPAP. Yeah. And, and talking about COPD or, or asthma for BiPAP. Is, is BiPAP ever appropriate in CHF is, is it, or is it just CPAP? So unless the person has a ventilation problem, what are you doing with the BiPAP? What is BiPAP adding to a CHFer's treatment? And I ask this because we all do it, right? Person has CHF, BiPAP. I, do, I used to do it all the time before I understood what it was actually doing. You could argue that for that inspiratory cycle, it's uh, just transalveolar pressure increasing it, so they fluid in their alveoli that you're at least 
cat's cycle pushing even harder? Potentially. Pushing that fluid. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially, but unless they have a problem with ventilation, I can just set my... my Your CPAP very high. Exactly. I can set my CPAP higher. You're also just keep, like, keeping alveoli open, preventing collapse. CPAP does that anyway, though, right? CPAP is already doing that. So what is the BiPAP component adding? Ventilation, but the patient's already ventilating. Comfort? Discomfort? Discomfort, actually. Discomfort. It's, but they're more comfortable on CPAP than BiPAP? And this is not comfortable, right? This is what I need you guys to understand. This is not exactly comfortable. This, is, this, is, this takes time to get adjusted to. But it's higher pressure on CPAP. Is that BiPAP, just about just about a BiPAP is not comfortable. I'm saying non invasive. Both of them are uncomfortable. This is positive pressure in your face. Right, but both, but both of them are Both of them are uncomfortable. Face, but, but it's kind of like saying, why would I give you an aspirin if you don't need it? It makes me feel better, but I'm not treating anything. Does that make sense? And also just remember what the underlying thing you're treating, right? In a CHF patient, you're treating a, flow, a forward flow problem and a oxygenation problem. Right. Right? In, in COPD, you're, you're, you're trying to think about it. Or other restrictive <coughs> lung disease problems, you're thinking you're trying to fix a ventilation <coughs> problem, like airflow problems. Mm -hmm. So they're two fundamentally different problems, and these two modes are tailored to address those problems. So, you know, if you find an optimal CPAP setting for someone who's a heart failure, you're assisting their flow to suddenly start changing that pressure while you're trying to optimize the forward circulatory flow, wouldn't make much sense. So, if it's a mixed picture COP versus CHF, does a BiPAP do any harm? For you? to the CHF process? That's when you get your ABG and figure out if you've, what well, you've done. Like in the acute phase, you don't have any information. Does it hurt to start? Does it hurt to start somebody on BiPAP? Was you're figuring out what is going on in your differential, the answer is no. Better to assist than not assist, but if you know that it's a pure CHF picture, what I'm arguing is that the BiPAP, the ventilation, that gradient component, isn't adding anything to the care. So that's down the line, though. So let's say patient comes in undifferentiated, short of breath. You don't know if it's a COPD exacerbation or a CHF exacerbation. Great. Slap them on BiPAP, okay, in order to prevent them from getting intubated. Once you figured out it's not a COPD exacerbation, it's a pure CHF, that extra, the BiPAP component, is the ventilation component, is not actually helping your patient. Does that hold true for uh, um, so that's like a whole separate lecture. Um, but what I can tell you is that you know high flow, that it's it's wonderful. Um, I actually really like using it. But realize that if a patient has their mouth gaping open, right? If they're a mouth breather and you put them on high flow, what exactly are you doing? All right. So there's a place and there's a time for it. Um, it kind of gives you a little extra peep. Is the thought process behind it? So it's kind of like CPAP. Okay. Yeah. So it's the extra pressure in your face, right? The it's the extra pressure in your face. So the patient's not necessarily feeling high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. They're feeling pressure, right? I'm not sure that a patient can differentiate 10 and 5. They're just feeling uncomfortable. It's kind of like you breathing. I really want you guys to think about this. If you stick your head out of a car window when it's going 80 miles per hour, do you think that's going to be comfortable? And you won't tell the difference if you slow down to 70 and then go back I mean, perhaps. Yeah, it's still not going to be comfortable. Okay, does that concept, you guys have a better understanding of this stuff now? Any other questions? Yeah. Can you actually explain the mechanism of how he decreases afterload one more time? I don't think that's fully understood. Decreases afterload by increasing your transmural pressure. So increases, positive pressure does a lot of things. One of the things it does is increase your transmural pressure. And by doing that, what it's actually doing is creating a gradient that allows the blood to flow forward out of the heart, <coughs> in essence, augmenting your cardiac output. Increasing the, well, you're, you're saying you're pushing all the blood from the lungs into the left atrium. That's I'm talking about the, from the left ventricle. So from the left ventricle into the aorta, it, the transmural pressure creates a gradient allowing better forward flow. In essence, augmenting cardiac output in a patient whose cardiac output is already pretty poor. You're basically augmenting contractility rather than decreasing. Mm, be careful with your words. You used to refer to this as a non-invasive. Uh, No. You are, you are pushing pushing forward. Forward. Correct. Think of it as a pressure bed. So, so that's contractility. No. I would not, unless I misunderstand it also, we are not actually, this is not like an ACE inhibitor decreasing. 
No. Exactly. For each cardiac output you have, it's just easier to get stuff out, right? So if my cardiac output is so poor, it just makes it easier for me to get stuff out because of the pressure gradients I've now created in my chest. Okay? My cardiac output is not changing. My valves are not changing. If they're diseased, they're diseased. They're going to stay diseased. All this is doing is making it easier for that blood to flow forward because of pressure gradients I've created in the chest. So it does. It's just it really again depends on what you do. But the if you set it correctly, your transmural pressure should increase such that you're increasing forward flow. Is this going to happen every patient? The answer is no. And this is also very very dependent on your vascular volume. Precisely. So if you are if you put someone on CPAP who's bone dry, the preload reduction is going to predominate in terms of dictating uh, forward flow. Your, your your decrease in preload is going to is going to outweigh any augmentation of this is all theoretical. What happens in your actual patient really depends on how your patient presents. But the reason that we use it, the reason that we use CPAP in a CHF patient is that it decreases preload and can decrease afterload as well. Okay, so theoretically it, it's helping with both, both ends. Okay, any other questions for now? I know this was a lot to wrap your minds around. Take a quick break. We're going to do cases. Yeah? It was okay? Yeah. It's a lot of info. Yeah, it is. It is. I, you know, the <laughs> It's like, it's so funny, right? Because like, people have a tendency to just want to like get into incredible detail and they're still like struggling with like the concepts yeah. that you're just, but you know, I think that's really good. Thanks. It's one of the better like introductions. Thanks. Hopefully you yeah. yeah. No complaints. Yeah, yeah. When did you make the switch to come here? Uh, September. Cool. Like literally just, I, mean, I was doing, I was doing a lot of Mickey. Like, yeah, I did Mickey for the last four years before now. And then, um, there were like, there were some changes there that, Thank you. 
As we wait for people to come back, what I'm going to ask you guys to do is at some point, please fill out those evaluations. Okay, this is really just for me. I don't care if you want to be mean. Please be constructive. The point is, this is actually something that I use to help make this lecture better for other residents. So tell me what worked for you, what didn't work for you. I promise I will incorporate the changes. Okay? All right, you guys ready? You guys ready to practice now? Put it to work? All right. So if you guys have your handouts, the cases are actually in the handouts. And you guys have a page that looks like this. This is your ventilator card. Okay, so take out a pen. You guys are going to start writing numbers. All right, you guys ready to get started? So the, uh, the synopsis of these cases are actually included in your handout. But we're going to kind of go through these in detail. So let's do this. So case number one, this is Edna. These are real patients, okay? Pictures obviously not, but the cases are real. 
So Edna is a 85 year old female. She comes to the emergency department one late night when you're working. EMS says that she syncopized. She fell down to the ground and she was having some trouble breathing. When they found her, she was agonal. So they decided to intubate her. They took the fun away, right? All right. So in comes Edna. Uh, Edna's, she's about 85. Her husband's about 92. He comes in with her and he says, Edna's been having a lot of trouble breathing for the last week. And we even went to her cardiologist and he gave us more Lasix. I don't know what happened today. I was washing the dishes. I turned around and she was on the floor. You've seen this before, right? Okay. Here we go. Edna's now in your shop, okay? And Edna has a history of COPD. She has CHF, her EF is about 20%. She's got an AICD. You have no idea why. And she's had a heart attack in the past. Um, you're gonna assume for a second that the AICD is because her heart failure is so bad, you can't really get any other information right now. So what's the first thing that you wanna do when this patient arrives in your emergency department? She's intubated in the field. Vital signs? Okay. Nurse is getting vital signs for you. Check tube placement. How do you want to check tube placement? Breath sounds? She doesn't have breath sounds on the left. What are you going to do? But she has them on the right. Mm -hmm. I get an x-ray. If her vitals are okay, I would get They're not. What are her vitals? They're not good. <laughs> Okay, so you're doing all that. You decide that you're going to actually use the glide scope because it's handy. You take a look. The tube is going through the cords, and you decide to pull back a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay. So at this point, she's like literally just rolling in. Okay. Stop. I promise I'm not going to give you an hour to take care of her. Okay. So. Uh, the nurses are kind of getting lines, they're putting her on the monitor, you're doing all the stuff, you've now manipulated the airway, you pull it back a little bit. Um, now what are you going to do? Listen. Listen again. Okay, so respiratory therapy is there now, they put her on the ventilator, you auscultate again, now you have no breath sounds. No breath sounds? No breath sounds. And when you look, you're panicked now. Okay, we she's... We don't panic, we put the probe on. Yeah. <laughs> what are you looking for? Check for, for pneumo or B line. No pneumo, no B-lines. No pneumo, no B-lines. No no, no lines. And by the way, you take a peek at the ventilator and she's pulling tidal volumes about 100. Plateau pressure? Plateau pressure? I don't know. I have a lunchbox ventilator. Have you guys ever seen those? I can set my FiO2 to 50 and 100. She's on a ventilator right now. So if respiratory discretion is intubated on a ventilator, what's the person you do? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you take her off the ventilator. All right. Um, so somebody wanted to get an x ray at some point. All right, so x ray's here. You're now bagging her. There's her chest x ray. Okay, she has no breath sounds, so you're going to actually look at the ET tube again. So yep. My first question is after I put her on the bag, I take her off the bag and bag her. Do I feel a lot of resistance when I bag Yeah, so why is he asking that question? Or in the tube? Yeah, so this is not your tube, right? So you have no idea what it looked like when you went in. You have no idea what the conditions were. The balloon's great. The balloon is inflated. Okay, so you have a chest x-ray. She does not have a pneumothorax. What do you guys actually specifically want to know from me when you're bagging her? Have you guys ever bagged a patient who has COPD? How hard is it, right? So the respiratory therapist is bagging for you and you ask, are you having a hard time bagging, right? That's what you want to ask. And he says, no, as he's like pumping away. Okay, what else do you guys want to do right now? So you want to check your tube placement? Can I just say one thing? What, when you guys disconnect your bag, right, what you've done is you've taken the ventilator out of your face and it's what the source of the problem is. So if you're trying to rapidly identify what the problem is, it's just the first step you do in taking one major of 
going through the troubleshooting, we took the ventilator out, that's still not working, then we can, like, if the tube is, maybe the tube is a problem. Okay, reason, what do you want to do? Then you can put a bougie in and switch out the tube. Okay. Or I'll Okay, so you suction the tube, nothing comes out. You want to go ahead and do the bougie, I'll let you do it. After we start her again, we re to hear Yeah, there's no breath sounds. There's no breath sounds. So I'm going to let you guys do both, okay? So you suction, nothing comes out. You want to go ahead and use your bougie, use one of your own ET tubes, great, you do it. You still have no breath sounds. Could we, like, press on the chest to see if his breath's stacking? Why would you do that? Why would I do that? Yeah. See if it, like, exhale all that other air that we're getting pumped. Okay, so we haven't done that yet, okay? So as you're kind of doing all of this stuff, you notice that her blood pressure is now dropping. Okay, her blood pressure is now 60 systolic. Okay, what does that mean? She could have been before when she was on the ventilator. She was on the ventilator for. She was on the ventilator for about a minute. You noticed that it was not working, so you popped her off. Okay, very good. So what I did at this point was I gave the respiratory therapist a job to do, and I said, go and get me a connection piece so I can start giving the patient inline nibs through the ventilator. And I actually took over bagging. Okay, this is when you actually want to have really have control and know what's going on in the room. And that's exactly what I did. I actually just stopped bagging the patient just to see what would happen. And what happened was exactly the noise that you made. The patient actually started exhaling very forcefully and very prolonged. What does that tell you? Air trapping, right? So what would have happened if we kept doing this? The respiratory therapist would tell me, no problems, right? He's bagging. What was he actually doing? So stuff was going in, nothing was coming out. Right, so why was the patient's pressure dropping? I'm decreasing the preload in a woman who probably has a pneumonia from her cough times a week, right? Probably why she also syncopized. She has COPD, that's probably kicked into high gear. Now I've decreased her preload. I'm not letting her exhale. This is a recipe for disaster, okay? And this is what makes intubating your COPD patient so scary. All right, what do you guys wanna do? So I let her exhale. I actually pushed on her chest, okay? I'm not a big person. I promise I can do big things if I need to. So I actually got up on her chest and literally pushed down, let her exhale for like a good two minutes before I let her take another breath in. What do you think happened? Pressure went up. So then now you can put her back on the ventilator and adjust the Okay, so I put her back on the ventilator, okay? Now I wanted, in our ED, we literally have these transport ventilators where I have zero information. This is not the patient that you want on a transport ventilator. This is a patient that you want every single piece of data that you can get off that ventilator, okay? So I put her on a real ventilator. What numbers am I looking at? What am I doing? What are you looking at when you look at the ventilator now? Now you guys know what these numbers mean, right? What are you looking for? What's the ID? It's whatever the machine preset. What's her rate? What's her rate? Well, what's she setting on the ventilator? I don't know. What'd you set? What'd you set? Take a minute. Set her on the ventilator. So write it down. Write it down on your charts. What do you guys want to ask me? You guys want to know any information? How tall is she? How what? How tall is she? She's about my height. Let's say five feet tall. We'll make the math easy. She's going to be about ideal body weight, 50 kilos. Okay, so we're going to do this out loud together. Okay, and it's okay if you guys are wrong. We're going to we're going to we're going to fix things. Okay, so mode of ventilation. What do you guys want to choose? Assist control, volume control. Okay, we'll start off with that. Tidal volume. 300. 300 is actually okay. Respiratory rate. Why are you guys so quiet? <laughs> what do you want to do? 30? Okay, set it at 30. Sure, you guys want a respiratory rate of 30. We're going to see what happens to the patient, okay? So respiratory rate of 30. Peep. I'll probably do it like 18 or 
18? She was, she's, she's comatose by the time she gets to you. So we're all guessing here. So 18 to 30. Does that sound good? I'll let you guys choose any number in between there. Write something down. Commit. Lower peep? Choose a number. Five? Give her a peep of five. What's her FIO2? What's she setting at right now? Now that you have her hooked up? No, she's setting about 92. 92? <coughs> 40%. 40%? Yeah. All right, put her on 40%. All right, so you guys are committing to this, right? You guys ready? Any objections? Yes. 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 Lower? Choose a number. We said 18 to 30. 10? 10? 10 you sure? She's not breathing, guys. 20? 20. 20. 20. Okay, final answer. 20. 20. Okay, all right, 20. Let's see what happens. Sure, I'll give you that too. 80. 20? We're sticking to it, right? All right, I'm going to show you guys what happens now. All right, so... What else do you want to do for this patient? Let's say you give her broad spectrum antibiotics, right? You're going to start, she's, you're assuming that there is a COPD component to this. So now you have inline uh, nebulization. She's going to be on continuous nebs. You're treating her like a COPD exacerbation. You're treating her like a pneumonia exacerbation. I actually have the respiratory therapist run and get me Heliox. You guys ever use that? I was literally in this room for an hour and a half. I could not leave this patient because I could not oxygenate and ventilate her. Okay, this, this was actually a really tough case. Fortunately, we did not crack open that Heliox. It's like $10,000 right there. Okay, fortunately, we got control before that. I even had one of my friends from respiratory from uh, the MICU come down and help me play with the ventilator because this was a really tough case. Now, let's kind of go through this. I'm going to give you, do you guys see that ABG that's down there? I thought Heliox was more for like she was dying. I was doing everything I could. I'm really, I'm, I'm making this really easy on you guys, but I really could not oxygenate and ventilate this woman for about an hour and a half. Okay. Case three, do you guys see the uh, ABG over there? So now you guys know that part of my uh, brain is an intensivist. What do you guys think about that ABG? Good, bad, ugly. Let's start off there. Case one, right? Case one. Can increase that FIO2? Do you want to increase the FIO2? Decrease it? I assumed 100%. So you guys want to do 40? You guys want to make any last minute ventilator changes? This is how the settings that they suggested. Which image you Case one. Number five. <laughs> Can anybody interpret that ABG? So this is after an hour and a half. This is after literally being in the room and working with her for about an hour and a half. This is your final ABG. You want to go up on our respirations? Come on, guys, final answers as we go through this. Her blood pressure, now I have it in the 90 systolic. She's good to go. Mick, you, we're done. Okay, so she was at 100. You guys suggested 40. I'll give that to you. <coughs> yeah, so, so you can. So in this case, 60 would actually be okay. I will tell you that the one difference between what I did and the, the settings that you guys had is that my respiratory rate was a lot lower. A lot lower. Eight. Does that make any sense? Well, now that I know she doesn't have like a crazy high CO2, as soon as they saw that 66, it's like she's probably a chronic retainer. She probably lives kind of higher. Uh huh. Like now I feel more comfortable with her being at a lower. Okay. So I want you guys to be really careful, this concept of chronic retainer, right? Do you guys understand, do you guys know the 60-60 club? Do you guys know what that even means? Okay, the 60-60 club. This is when a person has a PAO2 in the 60s and a PAO2 in the 60s and they're just chronically horrible lungs at baseline. 
You have to be so careful before you say that a COPD -er has really bad lungs at baseline, right? Unless you can pull up an ABG for me and say that this is where they live and their pH is normal and they're always hypercapnic and they live like this, you actually don't know the answer to that. And in an acute process, I'm not saying overcorrect, permissive hypercapnia is okay, but I wouldn't let them be 70, 80, 90. Okay? How do I know that this is an acute process? Look at that pH. That pH is not normal. Okay? That tells me that this person does not live at this number. So, yeah, so there's a second process going on, right? So this is actually a triple acid base disorder. So this is a respiratory acidosis, thank you, with a metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. All right, so this one is kind of sick. Why do you start so low? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. So let's go through, and this is kind of what you guys were doing, okay, when I asked you to troubleshoot, and I want you to actually see this on paper. So there's a lot of mnemonics out there. I just chose the DOPES mnemonic. I don't care what you choose, because you guys can actually do it without mnemonics. You just showed me that. But let's go through it. So if a patient is having trouble breathing on the ventilator, what do you do? First thing is you want to check the tube, right? You guys did that. So just make sure that you attach to end tidal CO2, check the placement, check the depth. We did that. You want to check for obstructions, right? We talked about mucus plugging. We talked about, we didn't talk about biting. You didn't ask me if she was awake and biting down on the tube. Well, that's going to prevent her from breathing, right? That's why we sometimes put these patients, we make them comatose so that we can take over. Pneumothorax. So you want to auscultate. We have ultrasound. We're really great at that. Get a chest x-ray. If you need to, these are the patients who are going to pop a bleb. Okay, so if you hear decreased breath sounds, you have proof on your ultrasound. This is when you do your chest tube. Equipment failure, very possible. <coughs> That's why we take them off of the ventilator and start bagging them so we get control and we know what they feel like. <coughs> and then there's this concept of auto peeping that you guys were talking about, and that's why you want to start them on bronchodilators. <coughs> this is auto peeping. What am I pointing to? What do you guys see here? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. So what you see here, this is your flow curve. The flow curve should come back to, sorry. <coughs> flow curve should come back to normal, to baseline, and it's not. And that tells you there's extra pressure in the chest at the end of expiration. And that's a problem. So it can. It most certainly can, right? Because there's going to be extra pressure. But in this case, this is actually exactly what I saw. This is not her ventilator. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's too many other things to go on for me to actually stop and take a picture of what was going on with her vent. But this is kind of what it looked like. What I saw when I was staring at the ventilator was that her curves were not coming back to baseline. <coughs> Do you guys know what the expiratory bu uh, button is? Have you guys ever seen that button? So you guys know where the inspiratory pause button is, right? Next to it, there's an expiratory pause button. That expiratory pause button allows you to calculate how much internal PEEP the patient has. So you set your PEEP at five, right? This patient has an, an extra PEEP of four and a half, <coughs> making their total PEEP of 9.8, meaning that they're not fully exhaling. They have all this extra pressure in their chest at the end of the respiratory cycle. Does that sound like it's gonna be a great way to breathe? Probably not, right? So what do we do for these patients? COPD, come on. You guys know how to manage this, right? Okay, so muck around with the IDE ratio, right? Is that what you're telling me? How do you do that? Change, <coughs> Change what? How do you do that? Yeah, how do you do that? Increase. You guys are saying all the right words. Just tell me how to do it. How do you increase? How, how would you decrease the short time, guys? Okay. Okay. Or? So I can increase the inspiratory flow rate, or I can decrease the respiratory rate. This is so counterintuitive. I'm going to show you guys this in picture form, okay? Because I had to see it in picture form to get it. 
<clears throat> we're going to work through this together, okay? You will never put a patient on these settings. This is really meant just to make the math super easy so you guys understand the concepts. So somebody has a title volume of a liter. Please don't ever do that. Nobody deserves a title volume of a liter, okay? So you put the patient on title volume of a liter, <clears throat> respiratory rate of 12, and their default inspiratory flow rate on the machine, you turn the machine on, the default is going to be 60 liters per minute. With me so far? You guys ready for fancy math? The total cycle time depends on your respiratory rate. Okay? So there's 60 seconds per minute. You set a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute. So that means that every five seconds, there's going to be another respiratory cycle. With me so far? So how do I change my IDE ratio? So my IDE ratio, if I have a flow rate of 60 liters per minute, this is why I chose 1,000 liters to make the math easy, it'll take me one second to push in that air. With me? So if it takes me one second to push in the air, my inspiratory time is one second, my total time is five seconds, that gives me a four second expiration rate, expiration time. Questions? You guys want to absorb this for a second? We're okay? Okay. I'm going to take exactly the same case. All I'm going to do is change the respiratory rate to 20. We were at 12, I'm going to go to 20. Okay? What happens? <clears throat> your total cycle time, so 60 seconds per minute, 20 breaths per minute, now your total cycle time is 3 seconds instead of the 5 seconds I had previously. My flow rate is exactly the same. I didn't muck around with anything else. I can push in a liter every second, which means my inspiratory time is now one second. That only leaves me two seconds to expire, which means that if I drop my respiratory rate, I've now increased my expiratory time. Does that make sense now? I see a little bit of confusion, but does that make sense? OK, I'm going to do it graphically for you. If my respiratory rate is 12, my total cycle time is 5 seconds. Okay? If my respiratory rate is 20, my total cycle time is 3 seconds. Which means that if my inspiratory time is held constant, my expiratory time increases if I decrease my respiratory rate. Make sense? Right? Problem solved? Now, the other way I can do this is increase my flow time. So one of the other things that you'll see the, the respiratory therapist doing sometimes is mucking with the flow rate. What that's doing is that if I can push the air in faster, that leaves me more time for expiration in a total cycle time. Okay, what are the dangers of doing that? That means more pressure in the chest quicker. So you're gonna have some consequences of that though. Make sense? Okay, do you guys now see why you decrease the respiratory rate? This is why I would set this patient's respiratory rate lower than normal to allow her to exhale until I've kind of got her through the hump of that COPD exacerbation, and this is why you reassess these patients. Cool? Make sense? Yeah. Right. Right. You're just pushing more air in that's not going to come out. And you're not giving enough time, enough time to exhale. Precisely. Precisely. That's why it makes sense to decrease your respiratory rate, actually, and to fix their COPD exacerbation at the same time. Okay? Yeah. The flow rate of 60 liters per minute is, is that? Default. That's, that's a default. default. So we don't mess with that. We're just messing with the rate we're controlling. So mess with one thing at a time, right? So I, you don't have to, like, do 10 things at a time because then you're going to have zero idea what you're doing to the patient. Everything I do on this machine has consequences. So if I muck around with the respiratory rate first, what I'm going to do is step back. They're on end tidal CO2. I'm going to see if their CO2 goes down. I'm going to reassess them with an ABG, see if I'm fixing the problem. Right? The problem in this patient was that she was not ventilating. Right? That's why she was so acidotic. If I can get her to ventilate, I should be able to correct the acid base problem. <coughs> okay? So for us, you would want us to mess with the respiratory rate first. <coughs> do one thing at a time. Forget about the flow rate for now. I mean, use that as like a second option. Here. So there are several ways that you can change the IDE ratio is what I'm arguing. What I'm arguing is do one thing at a time. You guys are going to be more comfortable messing with the respiratory rate than you are with the flow rate. There are consequences to everything we do. Do one thing at a time, reassess, and then if you need to, change the other thing. I just make one point. Just, just recognize that this is a rock. This is like a worst case. 
This is a hard case. We have patients with a ventral cord problem and because of their breath stacking and it increased intrathoracic pressure, had a blood pressure problem, had a circulatory problem, right? So you're trying to tread the line between the two. Don't take the message that for every restricted <coughs> COB patient, you want to automatically zoom to a low rate, right? Because the, the flip side to this is you, you know, depending on how what, how bad their respiratory acidemia is, and you have to stay on top of it. Correct. Uh, ideally, you want to optimally ventilate these patients, but if this patient is <coughs> doing that, then you have no blood pressure. So you're treading a very fine line. But in any of these patients, I guarantee you, and I would also be doing, is checking repeated gases to make sure that the pH wasn't bottoming out. Right? That's why I looked at this gas and I was like, nah, not bad. Blood pressure 90, pH 7.2, you've won, right? 7.27, I mean, that's a, that's a viable pH and it's a, and it's a blood pressure that's the same. Right? So that's what you're looking for. And optim someone saying, when they looked at this gas, they said, oh, increase that rate, let's fix that, right? But then you're gonna zoom back into that breath stacking hypertension problem. So just, you're treading, you're walking between two, a rock and a hole. Absolutely, so this was an incredibly difficult case right, because there were several different disease processes happening at the same time, all very acutely. She was dehydrated, she had pneumonia, she was a COPD exacerbation. This was not a pure anything. That ABG was after an hour and a half of me being in the room and mucking around and getting multiple ABGs. It got to the point where I put an A-line in her because I was checking them about every 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, so this is a patient that you don't walk away from. Yeah. Um, I actually wound up paralyzing her to take over, but realize that if you paralyze, that means that this patient cannot participate in the respiratory cycle. That means it's more on you. I mean, I assume that like you're decreasing her respiratory rate. Yeah, she's not going to do this by herself. Six because she's not ventilating for herself. So right. If you, left, if you just paralyze her, she's probably breathing more. Correct. Correct. This is the kind of patient where you need to take over. This is not a pure COPD patient. Okay, for a pure COPD patient. Assuming that there's no pneumonia, there's nothing else going on, would I use a respiratory rate of 30? Eh, unless they came in like that, probably not. Okay, would I use a respiratory rate of six? Probably not, right? You have to find your sweet spot and you have to make sure that you reassess these patients. And tidal CO2. Make sense, any questions on that case? Yeah. So go along with what uh, Jenny was saying, I mean, you could get good information if the patient was not paralyzed, could you not obtain good information? I mean, I don't know the proper term, but intubated version of BiPAC, would that not provide you with good information as far as what, what the patient's uh, underlying respiratory status was, if, if she wasn't paralyzed? So the problem was that when she was not paralyzed, we couldn't get control of her ventilation. She was trying to assist, it was not working, right? A patient who's not breathing panics, right? She was not helping, she needed to kind of be out of the picture for this case. This is what you'll see with like really difficult ARDS to control, really difficult COPD to control. Sometimes you just need to paralyze them and take over. You've probably experienced that when you're in the Mickey with these patients. I'm not saying do this for every single patient. Please don't take that away from this lecture. Okay, this was a really difficult case. Okay, let's switch gears. Let's do another case. One more case. We'll do one more case. <coughs> All right, so this guy, you've seen him before. His name is Greg. Um, he is a very loud personality who comes into your emergency department after being intoxicated on his uh, motorcycle. He crashes. He's not especially happy. He basically shatters his entire right side. He's got about ribs two through, let's say, ten broken. He's got a pulmonary contusion. He's cracked his clavicle. He's cracked his scapula. He's got some leg injury. He's not a very happy person. And by the way, he wants to tell you that he's been in and out of the prison system three times to intimidate you. Great. What are you going to do? What do you want to know about this guy? Come on, guys, home stretch. Hmm? So, is he protecting his airway? Um, he's talking. Breath sounds. You have you have not the greatest breath sounds on the right side, but you hear some breath sounds. Um, he's got a flail segment. A flail segment. What do you want to do? Chest tube, right? So you put a chest tube in him. Here's what his lungs look like. Does that look happy? No, okay? So I'll tell you that while he's in the emergency department with you, he deteriorates, okay? There's your chest tube right there. He deteriorates, you wind up having to intubate him. So I crossed paths with our friend over here when he was actually in the sickie with me. Um, so he came up intubated. So this, it was a picture after this. Um, he came up, the first day we kept him 
intubated because he had to go off to surgery to fix his leg and then we had to get an MRI of his C-spine. This was not a guy who was going to sit still for an MRI. So I kept him intubated overnight. The next morning I come in and his family members have undone his restraints and he's self-extubated. Of course it was. Rockstar. Yeah. So what do you want to do? He did for the time being. For the time being. More importantly, his chest tube was in. Chest tube was in. <clears throat> he did not get to that. We got him before that. So um, you can hear him cursing from across the sicu. Mentating? Oh, he'll tell you to your face what he thinks of you. Again, that still doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like, how, how the breath sounds? Did we repeat the chest x rays? So, repeat the chest x ray. It doesn't look any different than this. He's actually mentating. What's his work on breathing? Right now, not bad. When he calms down, it's not bad. So, I potentially was going to extubate him. He just wasn't trialed. So, I didn't know if he could do this or not. So he trialed himself, is that what you guys are telling me? Well, he's in the I mean, that's what actively has. Okay. Okay. I think, I think, I think at that point, he's probably fine, and the appears fine, but with the type of injury he has, I think he'll eventually be decompensated. Yeah, so he's at high risk of decompensation, right? I basically told you. So his entire right side is not working so well, right? So that's what you guys need to be nervous about in a case like this. That's what's going to be nerve wracking in a guy who comes like this to the ED. Okay, so made a decision. I'm not going to intubate him. He's phonating pretty well. He's kind of holding his own. Let's just kind of see what happens, right? Because my plan was I was going to trial him on extubation anyway. I know not the lecture, but how about high flow? Um, he didn't need it. He was actually oxygenating pretty well. So not just yet. All right, so I come in the next morning. It's now 7 o'clock in the morning. Here's his chest x-ray. <clears throat> so what's your first reaction? I'll tell you mine was, well, he's obviously rotated. Okay? <laughs> All right, sorry, shot another chest x-ray. It looks kind of like this. Did, what happened? Did, just to go back, did, did they do anything in terms of just pain management? Yeah, yeah, he was on a drip. He was on a PCA drip. He, don't worry, his pain was well managed. Well, well managed or really overly well managed? Nope, nope, this nope. Is a good patient for like a, a, a block? So he actually had already gotten um, intrathoracic blocks. Okay. So I, I think that's more like pulmonary contusion. Okay. Chest tube still in. This is his chest tube. Is anything coming out of it? That's his chest tube. Is anything coming out of it? No. There's no blood. So what are you guys seeing here? You think this is just pulmonary contusion? Yeah, Atelectasis. Atelectasis? So his entire right chest wall collapsed. Yeah. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, his right chest caved in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you actually look at this guy, there's quite literally a divot in his chest wall. What do you do? He's, by the way, not intubated right now. He's not what? He's not intubated. He's not, I'm sorry? He's not intubated. No, now, we, now you intubate him. Do you intubate him first? Versus? I think, I think you want to be careful because in this patient, positive pressure can cause a pneumo. So it's either you're checking that chest tube or you're seeing another chest tube. Then... So he has a chest tube. Do you want to put another one in before you intubate him? You said his chest wall is Uh-huh. That is The entire chest wall caved in. This is, this is worst case scenario flail segment, guys. This is what happens. He needs surgery? Well, okay. Um, so you guys see where I work. Okay, um, there is one surgeon, it's now Saturday by the way. There's one surgeon who knows how to do this procedure to fix a person's chest wall and they can't get the materials until Tuesday. So what do you want to do? Two main stem intubations. Main stem intubation. So here was my concern with this guy. So there's another pneumo. You guys see all this subcutaneous air? There's another pneumo that I cannot see. And my concern was that if I intubated this guy, he was going to crash. So what I actually did, he was, he was awake, he was phonating. I told him, I'm putting another chest tube in, right? This was not low-level chest tube. And the reason for that is that he's cracked basically every single rib, and his chest wall is caved in. And there's a very high risk of you cutting yourself as you did this. So this is a chest tube that I placed. Okay, so I placed a second chest tube going high. Now I knew that I had control of the airway. I intubated him. What, what size chest tube did you put in him? The biggest one I can get. I could put a 42 in. Wives? 
so big? Um, <laughs> concern for pneumo versus hemo, why not just... How do you know what's going on in here? You know there's no hemo? He came, he came in with a hemo pneumo he came in with a hemo pneumo. The answer is you have no idea what's going on in here. All I see is really horrible collapsed lung. Is there a chance he's got a hemothorax? The answer is about a 99% chance, right? He's cracked every rib. I bet you those things are bleeding. His intercostals are probably bleeding. And I've got zero activity here. I'm going to get one chance to do this, right? So I put a big chest tube in. He tolerated it. Then we intubated him. Um, how are you guys going to oxygenate and ventilate him? What ventilator settings are you going to use? Give me your tidal volume now. <coughs> Do you want to reinflate this? <coughs> is, is there an air leak when you. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you probably want to lower tidal volume. Lower. Um, uh, him by a scope and go down the left. The intubation was not hard. No. He's saying he's a left main, left, left main. So you're saying one lug ventilation? You want to completely knock that lung out? You want to ventilate, but it's not going to be very helpful for the other I would still ventilate both. I would start with a title volume so that you can still use and improve from the right. Okay. And then you can dominate the left. Did you say APRV? PRVC. Okay. <clears throat> the mode of ventilation is not the important thing here. I was able to use a cis control vo uh, volume control, and he did great. But what did I do differently in this guy? Paralyzed him. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. We actually restricted family members, yeah. more importantly. <clears throat> so I used one lung ventilation. <clears throat> but how did I do it? <clears throat> so I actually put the ET tube in. Regular old ET tube, right? I'm an ER doc. I do not do double lumens. <clears throat> but what I did was that I counted, basically, this lung was not going to be working so well, right? So let's say this guy's six feet tall. What's the tidal volume you want to put him on normally? He's six feet. Yeah, this is your 500 guy, right? So if I put him on 500, what's going to wind up happening? I'm going to hurt his good lung. Yeah. Am I going to blow open this lung? Probably not. So the chest wall is caved in, right? This guy has zero compliance on that side. I'm not going to be able to blow this thing open. In fact, what I'm going to probably do is create more pneumos and create more bleeding, right? Probably not going to work. So what I did was just find the sweet spot so that I can actually ventilate him well. It actually worked really well. I couldn't put him down on this side for obvious reasons. That's another thing that you can do when somebody's bleeding out or there's that other problem. Okay? This guy was not a one lung down kind of guy. <clears throat> and what we did was basically wait until we can get this guy to the OR. These are end stage cases that I'm telling you guys about, right? These are super difficult cases. What wound up happening? Here he is now. Wait, sorry. So you, you said you, you did one? You had I, I used a regular old ET tube. I just gave him less volume. Oh, okay, but in the... Regular old, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what, what, what volume did you end up doing? 350. So you started it, did you start at 250 and go up? Where did you? I picked 350. All that stuff was the same. Okay, but what I did was frequently check ABGs to make sure that this was working for this guy. All right? So you guys see what happened to him? You guys see all this pretty material he's got now on the inside. So these are actually um, hardware that they use to fix fibulas. There's no such thing as rib plating. Turns out, I learned that from this case. <clears throat> What's the issue with this guy? If this guy gets sick again, what are you going to have to think about? Is this lung going to work the way that it was on the other side? No, right? This guy actually does not have any great compliance. He's not going to be able to expand and contract his chest wall on that side like he normally would. This guy getting sick when he's 75 is going to be a big deal. All right, cool case, end stage case, OK? But thing for you guys to think about. Am I out of time? OK. So I'll kind of do this real quick. Um, I'm just going to go through the ARDS. Just make sure you guys look up the ARDS protocols, right? Know your PEEP and your FiO2 levels. Know how to use your PEEP. Uh, just in summary, patients are decompensating. Please check your tube. Please take them off the ventilator. The ventilator could be part of the problem. Bag them to get a sense of what's going on. Check your ABG and PAO2. You guys know now what the peak and plateau airway pressures are and what you're trying to achieve. You guys know a little bit about PEEP. Remember to correct hypoxemia more than hypercapnia. Permissive hypercapnia is okay, except in brain or neuro injured, uh, I apologize, neuro or cardiac injured patients. Use PEEP. You guys know now what it does to recruit the alveoli. Remember to think about your respiratory rate. Everybody does not get the same number. 
And then for ARDS, this is what they recommend. I do not recommend that you guys let the PaO2 go this low, okay? But remember, don't hurt the patient as you're doing this. And then uh, use low tidal volume ventilation, please, in the ED. Any last questions? And feel free to email me if you guys have any other questions, okay? Anything else?